one. Okay, and we are recording. So this is going to be the final lecture of Earth, ter of Earth 10 for this term. Um, and I've really enjoyed having everybody in this class, even though doing things online has reduced the amount of face-to-face -face interaction. And there's a lot of people I haven't gotten to talk to or interact with as much as I would have liked to, but I still really enjoyed teaching this. And I hope that people found at least some of what you've learned about Antarctica interesting. Um, so today's lecture is a recap. There's no new material in this lecture. Um, and Monday's lecture was also a recap. It covered the material that I taught before the midterm, since that is fair game for the final exam, but it's only going to take up about 11 or 12 questions out of 50 total. Um, so you will want to look over the study guide for the midterm exam at least one time. Um, and there is also a study guide with the term, the key terms from the lectures released after the midterm, now available on Gaucho Space. So today's lecture will recap those, those lectures conducted since the midterm, um, namely the lectures on glaciers, the history of Antarctic exploration, and then the unit on climate change. So the final exam is going to be structured very similarly to the midterm. It's going to consist of 50 questions, which will be multiple choice or true or false, and they'll be automatically graded by Gaucho space. And then about 11 or 12 of those will focus on concepts introduced from before the midterm. Well, the rest will focus on the material we've learned since then. And these questions may reference the readings and the non-lecture videos that I have assigned since the midterm. And those are the climate change articles, the, the, short, the Shackleton excerpt, um, and the video clips of Encounters at the End of the World, Antarctica, Year on Ice, and the um, second episode of Frozen Planet about climate change. Um, and again, if you've seen them once, that's probably just fine because focus on the focus on the study guide and the lecture. But if you haven't read or seen those, make sure you've done that. Um, as for any articles I had you read before the midterm or any non-lecture videos like March of the Penguins or um, Walking with Dinosaurs, that is not going to be on the exam at all. So don't bother, don't bother rereading or rewatching those. Um, um, and so the study guide recaps key terms found throughout the lecture slides, and it's a skeleton from which you can improve your understanding. So when I say skeleton, I mean that there's information in the slides that obviously isn't on the study guide. And then there is information in the videos that I made of the of myself lecturing about the slides that is going to provide hopefully more context. Um, I think that is especially true with the Antarctic history um, part when I really did try to make the lectures help thread together themes for what can come across as just a bunch of different, just a whole bunch of way too many slides about this exhibition, this expedition and that expedition and this other expedition. Um, so uh, feel free if you are looking over the study guide and you can't figure out why a term is it doesn't, it's not obvious to you why a term is significant, feel free to email me about it. Um, and I am going to be available by email next week. And also I will be having office hours um, on Monday and Wednesday of next week, even though I won't be hosting a formal presentation. So you can feel free to come and ask me questions then if you haven't taken the exam already um, or shoot me emails next week. Uh, it's supposed to say 38 through 39. I will, I will fix that when I upload the slides. So the exam is going to be open all of finals week. It'll be open from Mon Monday, March 14th at midnight until the Friday of finals week, which is March 19th at 11.59 PM. And once you begin your attempt, you have 75 minutes to complete it. You are not to look at the slides or at your notes while taking it, or the internet for that matter. It's it's You should have studied before and should not really should not be doing anything aside from taking the exam or have anything open when you're taking the exam. Um, if something happens with Gaucho space or with your internet connection while you're taking the exam, get in touch with me right away. Um, whenever your internet gets back, basically, um, because I can usually see when something happens, like there's just a bunch of questions you didn't answer. And that's, it's really obvious to me that that's a glitch and not something you did. So just, just let me know. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry about me needling you. I, I, I can, I can tell pretty easily. So I'm very happy to just, just set that up again. Um, and I did go over the exam format last review session also, but does anybody have any questions about this before I move on? That sounds like a no. I heard someone's microphone being tapped, but I think that's just background noise. So um, I did want to briefly talk about assignment number two again, because that's the one bit of work that is still due outside of the final exam. So this is the 
academic article write up. And if you have not already picked out an article to write about, that's do that now, basically. Um, I am happy to check out whether something is a good fit. Like I'm happy to look at an article and say, yes, this is what I'm looking for, or no, this is closer to a summary or a news article about science as opposed to an original academic publication made by the people who are doing the science themselves, which is really what the distinction is between the type of literature I want you to write about for this assignment versus what I had you write about for assignment number one. And the article this time needs to be an academic article that's been published in a peer reviewed research journal. And I've had a couple people ask me how to know for sure that uh, that a particular journal like Nature or Antarctic Science or GSA Today or um, or any the, the actual title of the, of the publication that puts the article out is peer reviewed. And if you're looking on the web, you should be able to find the website for whatever journal it is and in their about section, they should clearly state somewhere that they are peer reviewed. Um, so you probably don't have to worry about that too much if you're using the UCSB research databases, because I find that I, I find that they don't tend to link to articles by, let's say, flat earth or creationist supporting sites, because that's kind of really what I'm trying to have y'all avoid. Like, like don't 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 send me creationist stuff. Don't send me stuff from flat earthers. Like, just just don't do that. But um, anyway, it's it should be pretty easy to find out whether something has actually been been reviewed by other scientists. And the the goal of peer review is to have people who are um, knowledgeable about the subject, but who didn't work on the project itself, verify to see if the science looks valid and if their methods are consistent and if their conclusions, like their findings, actually line up with the scope of their project. So one of the questions, so the main points you have to answer in this um, assignment are what research goals were, which they should state somewhere clearly. Um, if you can't figure out for the life of you what they're trying to do, then you might want to pick a different article or at least have me look at it. Um, and you need to talk about what their findings were, including whether they expected to find those, including whether those findings were what they expected or not. Um, if they don't address that, then you can just say they didn't address that. Um, but otherwise, you are able to write freely. Um, and this is why pick a subject that you're interested in, like penguins or um, climate change or Mount Erebus or Shackleton's expedition. Again, I am happy with you doing with you writing about articles that are related to Antarctica, but might be more related to history or social science. Like they, like sometimes there've been like psychological studies of um, how humans behave in, um, how humans behave on the Antarctic basis. If you found something like that um, and it met all these other criteria, that's perfectly good for this, for this because I want it to be something that's interesting for you. Um, and you don't have to pick a long article. In fact, I'd suggest you don't because it's not necessary that you find something ridiculously hard to do for this. Um, and just make sure that you link it and don't pick something that is a news article. Don't pick something that is somebody else writing about somebody else's science. Um, so before I move on to the midterm, excuse me, the uh, final exam material, does anybody have questions about assignment number two? Okay, and feel free to shoot me emails if you need advice on your article. So this is basically what we will be recapping today. Um, we had two lectures on glaciers, followed by three rather distinct lectures on Antarctic history. The first on early pre-heroic age exploration, the discovery of the continent, and then the second on the massive speeding up of exploration during what's known as the heroic age, late 19th century, early 20th. And then the third lecture on the 20th century history of Antarctica, leading into a discussion of what Antarctica is like today in terms of geopolitical conflicts and economic, economic activities and wildlife conservation. And then lecture 15 introduced the science of climate change with lecture 16 focusing on climate records from Antarctica as well as the effects of climate change on the continent during the second half. And 75% of the questions will draw from this material. Some of these, may, some of those questions might reference the articles and movies you've been assigned, but for the most part, what you need to study for the lecture is on these, what you need to study for the final exam is within these lectures. So in the first Glaciers lecture, we talk about how glaciers fit into the overall 
um, water cycle and how they actually contain most of the fresh water on Earth. We went into some of the physical varieties of glaciers. We have continental glaciers that are not constrained by their surrounding topography, like the valleys and mountains. And that includes the enormous ice sheets found covering Antarctica and Greenland, as well as some smaller ice caps in places like Iceland or the Canadian islands. We also then have a variety of glaciers whose shape is defined by whether they're accumulating in a cirque, those bowl-shaped valleys up where glaciers often start their course, or whether they're flowing through a valley, or whether they're reaching the ocean. And remember that a glacier from its starting area to where it ends is going to become many different types of glaciers over its course. And remember how I often refer to glaciers as being like rivers. Rivers do the same thing. Rivers go from being fast moving and full of rapids and rapidly cutting down and eroding in the mountains where the water's moving really fast to a slow muddy trickle by the time they reach the ocean. And obviously glaciers don't experience the exact same evolution in their course, but rivers change as they flow from where they start to where they end, and the same is true of glaciers. And the potential question here is one set up to remind you of what type of glacier is largest and which is most important as a reservoir or a place where water stays, most important as a reservoir of fresh water. So when I say a reservoir, again, that's just any place where water stays for a long time. So where among these various reservoirs is most of Earth's fresh water? Indeed, the answer is B, because as I mentioned, most of Earth's fresh water is found in glaciers and the largest glaciers by far are the ice sheets that cover Antarctica and Greenland. And so the, and so a process of elimination on this would work with the fact that I emphasize that, okay, lakes and groundwater don't take up that much and then the rest are types of glaciers. And since the answer isn't just glaciers as a whole, you're going to pick the glaciers that actually cover entire continents versus those that only occur in a couple of specific settings. So any questions about any of this material or material from the first part of um, this would have been lecture, uh, phooey, that's uh, lecture 10, I believe. Yes, lecture 10. The glaciers lectures aren't quite as well defined in terms of like what goes in which because there's a lot to cover. Um, the second half of lecture 10 after I introduced physical varieties of glaciers, I talked about some 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 details about their course, like some interesting things about what happens as a glacier flows from where it's accumulating in the center of the continent to where it's ablating outside of the continent. Because in Antarctica, actually, there's still so much well, anyway, I don't want to give anyway. Um, I don't want to give the answer to the question away, even though you might know that already. But we talked about how the fastest parts of glaciers flow as ice streams, and how the ice in the center and the ice that's sort of on top of the glacier, aka not on the bottom scraping against the rock, the ice on the top and in the center will flow fastest because it has less friction. And we talked about how subglacial lakes exist because of the high pressure of the ice, allowing some some melting to occur where the ice is really, really thick. And so you have a few lakes under the ice, like Lake Vostok, where, um, above which the main Russian base is presently built. Um, and it's not a coincidence, actually, that you have a lot of these subglacial lakes in the really cold interior parts of the continent, because that's where you have the most ice accumulating and where the glacier is thickest. And that gives the most pressure. And that's where you actually get the melting at the very bottom, melting from the pressure of the glacier as well as the contribution from the um, from the heat of the earth. Oh. Katie says hi, and she has to get moved because she was in front of my notes. We talked about how ice you have ice falls, you have places where a glacier suddenly um, suddenly flows from a shallow slopes to a steep slope or vice versa. Um, and that causes an equivalent of a waterfall. And also, if you go back to the lecture slides and look at the picture, you'll notice that the ice in the icefall is really broken up. It's full of crevasses because that's a pretty sudden source of stress, the slope changing, changing that fast. Or the slope changing relatively suddenly from the pr perspective of a flowing glacier, which moves about as fast as your fingernails grow in a year and is you really have to kind of 
it's like you have to think about time in a time in a very slowed down sense to get to get an idea of just the fact that there are stressors that come along that from a glacier's perspective, AKA the perspective of ice that is moving really slowly are pretty sudden and that it can't respond to you very quickly. Um, I'll talk more about glacier movement on another slide. And remember that glaciers, when they're moving slowly, when they can move without a lot of stress building up, the ice deforms. But when something happens relatively sudden compared to the rate of their flow, they ice crystals don't have time to rearrange and you get cracks, you get crevasses forming. Anyhow, um, I talked a fair bit about what happens to glaciers in the ocean, how a lot of Antarctic glaciers continue as ice shelves, and how you have ice shelves, which are the extensions of glaciers, and icebergs, which break off from the ice shelves, as well as sea ice, which has nothing to do with land-based glacier formation, and is just simply from seawater freezing. So um, Antarctic glaciers are pretty unique because in most parts of the world, you don't have the glaciers actually extending over the ocean. The ice shelves like you have in the Ross Sea or um, like this one in the Antarctic Peninsula that's presently breaking into smaller pieces because of the warming ocean, these ice shelves are actually extensions of the glaciers. So Antarctic glaciers continue to flow out over the ocean as ice sheets when they reach the ocean because what process is still occurring on the coast? So what's the answer here? And the answer is, the answer is, um, the answer is actually accumulation. Um, some people said C, some people said D. The answer is indeed C. Because remember, accumulation is when glaciers are building up and ablation is when glaciers are breaking up. Like when abla if a glacier is ablating, that means it's going away. If it's accumulating, it's getting bigger. So glaciers are in a sense still getting bigger when they reach the ocean in Antarctica, at least in many areas, because there's still, it's so cold in Antarctica and there's still enough, there's still enough snowfall at the coasts that glaciers aren't really breaking up right at the coast. They actually end up breaking up farther out in the ocean and um, breaking up there. So calving is when the glaciers break up out over the ocean. Um, and that's a term you want to be familiar with definitely. Um, but this is just a case where I put two terms that are relevant to glaciers breaking up or getting bigger. Accumulation, when glaciers get bigger, or ablation, when glaciers go away. And then equilibrium is the balance between accumulation and ablation, and that doesn't really explain it. Um, Plucking is related to glacier erosion, so you can roll that one out. And then calving is when the glaciers are breaking up. Calving relates to glaciers collapsing. So you want the term that's specifically related to glaciers building up because the ice shelves exist because glaciers are still building up um, at the coastline in Antarctica. Meow, meow. On that note, does anyone have questions about this, about this slide before I move on? So um, remember also that aside from aside from shape, there is a distinction between warm base and cold base glaciers. There is a distinction on temperature. And in Antarctica, the it's so cold, the air is so cold because the sunlight doesn't heat the air effectively because we're at a high latitude where the solar radiation is hitting the earth at a very shallow angle. The, it's, hit, it's hitting the earth and being very spread out. So the surface of the glacier isn't heated that effectively. Um, and in Antarctica, where you mostly have cold base glaciers, the ice temperature is actually fairly cold at the surface and gets slightly warmer as you go from the top of the glacier to the bottom because you have some, because you have some heat from Earth, from Earth. I did mention that you, you do have some subglacial lakes in Antarctica, um, but you don't have that many and you don't have in general a lot of meltwater forming at the bases of glaciers in Antarctica because the pressure melt temperature of water, remember, is the temperature at which you can go from solid ice to liquid water, depending on different pressures, because the melting point of water changes with the pressure. So, so in general, as the pressure goes up, it's easier to melt. Um, you can, at higher pressures, you can be at a lower temperature, but still have some liquid water. Um, now that does sometimes happen in Antarctica, but for the most part, the ice temperatures stay below the pressure melt temperature, even at the bottom. And so you don't get very much meltwater forming. Whereas in glaciers that form in mountainous regions of South America or Africa or North America, basically 
basically when you have glaciers that are forming because it's cold and high up, remember that in re remember that you're still going to have you're still going to have the sunlight hitting pretty directly, even even if overall the air is a bit colder. Um, and in in glaciers that you find in mountainous areas closer to the equator, the ice temperature actually is about follows a path that is about the same as the path of the pressure melt temperature, meaning that um, the glaciers in general do actually get warm enough to produce a little bit of meltwater. The temperature is right along the pressure melt temperature, so that's why it doesn't melt completely. But if you're if you're at or close to this line, you can have some ice and some meltwater. And the reason this is important is because how glaciers move depends in part on how much meltwater there is at the bottom. Um, glaciers either slide down, and that's if you have more meltwater, or they slowly deform with the ice rearranging itself as the whole system slowly rolls downhill. And that by far dominates much more heavily with Antarctic glaciers. Remember that this is a separate distinction from physical types of glaciers, like valley versus cirque versus continental glaciers. Any questions about this stuff? All right then, so moving on into glacial movement. Um, we learned about how glaciers can either move as a single cohesive mass and how that's more common with warm base glaciers, um, or how they can flow like a very thick viscous fluid downhill. And if glaciers are under a lot of stress, or if the stress comes pretty suddenly for a glacier, like if you have glaciers making sharp turns or um, making making an ice fall, like going from a shallow slope to a steep slope all of a sudden, or if you have glaciers flowing over a mound, like if there's a resistant, there's a hill made of resistant rock underneath them, this can form crevasses. This can form um, this can form cracks in the glacier. And for the most part, glaciers prefer to, in a sense, they prefer to undergo plastic deformation. They prefer to, they prefer to have the ice rearrange and and change shape, have the crystal, have the actual crystals of the ice change shape without without having a break form. But if the stress comes on too suddenly, then they don't have time to rearrange and you just form a crack. And the interesting thing about crevasses like these is that they come and go as the glacier changes the landscape underneath it. For example, if a glacier is being is getting crevasses because it's flowing over a mound, then if that mound does get eventually worn down so that there's not much of a mound anymore, you won't get many crevasses there anymore. Um, and speaking of which, that brought us into glacial erosion, how glaciers break down and remove material surrounding them, and how that's different from the erosion that we see in areas that aren't heavily glaciated. So most erosion in Antarctica is not performed by liquid water, as it is in California or China or anywhere else that's not that where there is liquid water and rivers dominating. You don't have much liquid water present at any given time in Antarctica, so the solid water actually does most of the erosion. The glaciers actually carve out the valleys and clear material away and pile it out into the ocean. Um, you do have some wind erosion from, you do have some ventifacts or rocks that are sculpted by wind, but that doesn't really compare in the amount of material it removes. It's just kind of an interesting little tidbit I included. So, Glaciers can basically either pluck, they can, um, if you have a buildup and sudden release of pressure, the buildup of pressure will make meltwater, but when the pressure is released, that'll cause the water to freeze and part of the rock that's frozen, it's connected to the glacier by the water, the meltwater that's frozen, it'll be just pulled off all of a sudden. And that's actually one reason why um, glacial till, which is the sediment that makes up the terminal moraines that's pushed at, pushed at the end of the glacier. That's one reason why it's so jumbled up because glaciers for the most part abrade, they, they grind what's underneath them smoothly, but they do also pluck and they also carry stuff on top of them. And when that all ends up at the base of the glacier in till, that till is a mix of ground down material and then some larger chunks of rock. Um, and I went into some of the different products of glacial erosion. Um, you have the ice rafted debris on the surface. Glaciers just kind of carry whatever falls on them, um, which is actually one reason why um, Antarctica is a good place to study meteorites because meteorites land in Antarctica and they just fall on the ice and they can be spotted pretty easily because um, they stand out against the ice much more than they do against the dark colored ground 
um, when meteors fall at temperate latitudes. And then you have till, the stuff pushed out at the end, as well as dianictite, which is the distinct large grains in a matrix of really tiny, tiny sediment grains rock that you get when till gets lithified or or converted into a into solid rock. And the terminal moraine, which tells you where the glacier ends, is made of this. You have outwash, which is the um, material carried by by meltwater, which you don't see as much of in Antarctica. But with glaciers, uh, which with glaciers in general, um, glaciers that produce a fair bit of meltwater, um, there will be light colored quartz based sediment in that water that will show up in the summer when the glacier is melting and not so much in the winter when the glacier is melting less. You'll see this in lake sediments where you have meltwater feeding into the lake and this pattern of varves, the alternating layers of glacial sediments and just organic lake sediments shows a seasonal pattern and you can actually study how that changes through time as one proxy for studying climate change. Um, and then there's glacial flour, which is just the stuff floating in the water. And then you have when glaciers melt and leave behind, um, they either melt on land and leave behind just these boulders that were carried by them and are miles and miles away from other mountains, or drop stones where um, glaciers that are extending over the ocean as ice sheets start to melt due to the heat of the ocean and the large pieces of rock that were just plucked earlier just kind of fall out and plop and end up on the seafloor. So we've talked about till a little bit, and this um, throws in a bunch of glaciation terms that are related and then some that aren't. So what's the answer here? Till in regards to the size of the grains of the sediment in it is said to be what? Lithified, abraded, well-sorted, poorly sorted, or erratic. And the answer is, um, the answer is indeed D, poorly sorted. And when I say sorted, that just means that there's a lot of stuff in it. It's not all one size. There is big boulders mixed in with lots of tiny grains, and it's just from the glacier grinding and pushing everything out of its path. Um, lithified means it's turned to rock, and that's a term I've mentioned a number of times throughout this course. It's not one you absolutely have to know, but I've talked about a number of processes where something like glacial sediments or um, plants, in the case of coal, get lithified by geologic processes or turned to rock. Um, abrasion is removal of glaciers, so that's not really relevant here. And well sorted would imply that everything, that the grains were all the same size and weren't just a jumbled mess. And then erratics are a completely different product of erosion altogether. So um, that's the sort of question I might ask about glaciers. Um, so I'll be moving on to Antarctic exploration and history next. Does anybody have questions about glaciers before I move on? Okay, feel free to ask later. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about Antarctic history. And on this slide, I've put together a number of broader thematic questions related to the history portion of the class. And I hope that while you're reviewing the slides and watching the videos, these questions might help you think about the motives for exploration at different points in history and about humanity's relationship with the continent in general. Like, why did no one know Antarctica existed until 1820? And there's a number of factors, like the fact that there's never been an indigenous population there. It's far from any, it's far from most inhabited lands. Um, the Antarctic circumpolar current and the strong winds make getting close to Antarctica dangerous. And even the people who did get close to Antarctica um, often didn't get close enough to see land because there's so much ice around the oceans. And um, this question, in fact, this this potential question, in fact, relates to um, a technology innovation later on that helped people get to Antarctica more easily. Um, and remember that I talked about how a lot of little islands like South Georgia were seen before the main continent because people often, because they're farther north and people would land on them first. And also they had more natural resources for people. That was where a lot of the seal populations were based and those also provided a base from which to hunt whales in the surrounding ocean. Um, so you had people living in sealing and whaling camps on the islands north of Antarctica, the sub-Antarctic islands, long before you had any bases on the continent itself. And what drove exploration? There is the hunt for science and for glory in the sense of wanting to be the first person to reach the South Pole. But there were also a lot of economic and colonial factors in people, in Europeans even, um, exploring more of the world in general and claiming more of the world. Um, and 
remember that later on we talked about how part of the impetus for putting the Antarctic Treaty System together was because countries had started claiming parts of Antarctica and people were concerned about warfare because sometimes people had claimed overlapping areas of land while making those claims. Um, and so on and so and so on and so forth. Like, it's good to have these in mind while watching the while watching the lectures. Um, and I will say that if you haven't seen the lecture videos related to exploration, like if you've just been going off my notes, I will say that it is helpful to watch the videos just because I think it provides some more context. So speaking of the potential question, in the 19th century, James Clark Ross entered the sea that would bear his name later, and he was able to penetrate substantially farther than previous explorers into the sea ice and the ice shelves because of what innovation? Um, so some of these I've mentioned, some of them I haven't. Some of them are, some of them are red herrings, like ships with no masts. Um, and the answer is D here. The answer is D here. Um, what you, because it was the reinforced hulls that actually made it easier to go in the ice. Um, remember that I, t I lingered on the fact that he used um, ships that had been built for warfare. They've been built um, with reinforced hulls to withstand bombings and also to withstand the 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 backlash from the ship itself launching can launching cannonballs out. Um, and the marine chronometer was something I talked about before. Um, the marine chronometer specifically relates to longitude and being able to being able to determine longitude, aka how e how far east or west you are at sea. Um, so it's an innovation that I talked about, but not directly relevant to penetrating the ice, more for knowing exactly where you are in terms of latitude and longitude. And same with astrolabe, actually. I didn't really talk about that much, but I, I mentioned it as how sailors calculated latitude, aka how north or south you are at sea, and how that was that had been in use for a long time. But um, the chronometer wasn't actually discovered until until before Cook's voyage. Um, so that's another thing. I mentioned that Captain Cook, who was who remember didn't quite get to Antarctica. He's mostly famous. He's famous for trying to reach Antarctica when it was still just thought of as this mythical southern continent. He was one of the first people to travel with a marine chronometer, but it didn't Remember, remember, it didn't really help him get into the ice. Cook turned back because he didn't have a reinforced ship. Um, and then ships with no mass is kind of, I put that in there because I was, I wanted to put icebreaker ships as one of the possibilities, but it's kind of hard to indicate like the difference between 19th century reinforced hull ships versus modern icebreakers. So I put ships with no mass in to be like, oh, people, Oh, people travel to Antarctica now on ocean liners that don't really use wind power, and that's true. But that's that didn't really help James Clark Ross off, and neither did aerial photography because that's more of a heroic age in event innovation. So, um, in terms of the different historical eras, this slide breaks down the history, um, and Lecture Twelve A focused on the pre-discovery of Antarctica. Um, the events leading into that discovery, like the first circumnavigation of the globe, the finding of the Drake Passage, the theories about the mythical Terra Incognita Australis continent that we now know is just Antarctica, and Captain Cook's attempt to find it. And Lecture 12b focused on the discovery of Antarctica and early exploration of Antarctica and the surrounding islands, a lot of that which was done for establishing whaling and sealing bases. And then Lecture 13 focused on the heroic age, which is when there was a very concentrated period of exploration, many different countries sent ships within a pretty short window of time. Again, it was only about 30 years, whereas the amount of time covered in lecture um, in lecture 12 is from prehistory until the 19th century. So it's a big, big summary, but the heroic age is just a pretty small window of time. And a lot more of the heroic age expeditions were launched with specific scientific purposes or with the goal of this expedition is to get to the South Geographic Pole or the South Magnetic Pole, as opposed to people sort of by chance discovering things or making observations because they were trying to find a trade route or trying to find new sealing grounds. And um, then Lecture 14A went on to the World Wars history um, of Antarctica and the immediate aftermath of that, when you had competing territorial claims and concerns about that leading to warfare on the continent, as well as some early military operations by the UK, um, trying to combat the Axis powers presence and the US trying to build bases there. Um, and how there was 
subsequently a renewed interest in Antarctic research during the international geophysical year during a thaw in the Cold War, um, and how that that gave an impetus, like a reason for people to consider setting aside Antarctica as sort of a neutral zone where military activities don't happen, where just science that is meant to be for the benefit of humanity occurs, which became the reason for developing the Antarctic Treaty, which is written to govern Antarctica, define it as a place where people, where countries cannot legally and enforceably claim territory, where military actions are forbidden, where mining is forbidden on the continent. Um, and then lecture 14b, in a way, talks about the consequences of all of this. Like, what is Antarctica like now? Um, talking about tourism in the continent, as well as what little economic activity does occur surrounding the continent, the tourism and the fishing and what consequences that might have and whether that's sustainable, and then a couple of geopolitical conflicts that have occurred. So um, you might recognize some of these slides. Some of these are, the slides are from the past review sessions and I, I kind of put them in here to put them all in one place. Um, but in terms of what people to focus on, um, this is actually, in terms of everything from lecture 12a, um, from the pre-discovery history of Antarctica, this is, um, I'm not even very likely to ask you about um, Bouvet de Lozier and de la Roche because I brought them up very briefly when talking about how you had a couple of scattered discoveries of tiny islands in between in between Sir Francis Drake's voyage to the South Sea and um, Captain Cook's voyages. Um, and these, I would say, are overall the big themes for the pre-discovery of Antarctica, um, the lack of indigenous people and its isolation from inhabited lands, the motivations for the motivations for European explorers even getting closer to Antarctica. Um, remember that Magellan and his crew got closer to Antarctica because they were specifically trying to find a trade route. Um, oh, my cat. Oh, Maki, that was not helpful. Cat on keyboard. There we go. I apologize for that. She's being a bad little kitty right now. Um, I lost my train of thought, but how it was the his voyage was to establish a trade route between Europe, specifically Portugal, where he lived, and um, colonies in East Asia. Um, and how discoveries sort of set the stage for scientific exploration. Um, and how many people, including Cook, Captain Cook, actually got close to Antarctica without realizing it. They were looking for this mythical lost continent where people believe, where go the governments that sent these expeditions believed there might be gold, there might be other riches. It's, again, I, I find the whole concept of terra incognita australis pretty fascinating because it's a good testament to how people will just kind of fill in whatever they want to think is there if they don't have any idea what's there. Um, just like the astronomy book that I had as a kid that um, where this artist had drawn the other side of Mercury, um, even though only one side of the planet had ever actually been observed at that point. Um, they've since sent a space probe that's seen the side of Mercury that faces the sun. Um, but I'm getting off topic. That's just kind of, anyway, um, that's just kind of why I linger on the whole Terra Incognita Australis concept because it's, I think it says something interesting about human behavior. Um, and the Lecture 12b then went into some went into some voyage some of the first voyages to Antarctica where people actually saw the continent um, and how you had people um, you had a lot of these people being around there to do sealing and whaling um, you had Bellingshausen who was a naval officer employed by Russia um, he saw it first but then. Um, Nathaniel Palmer, who was down there for sealing, saw it also very shortly after, and how Antarctica became public knowledge pretty quickly. Um, even though nobody, very few people were willing to get very near it just because of the danger of sailing, sailing wooden ships into, into sea ice. Um, so some of the people I talk about here, like um, Dumont d'Urville, who was sent to look for the South Ge South Magnetic Pole, excuse me, went there specifically for scientific purposes. Um, some went there for economic reasons related to sealing or whaling, like Palmer. Um, or Waddell also, um, who was actually interested in science, but was was get but got the funding to go to Antarctica because he was he was working as a sealer. Um, 
and you don't have a ton you don't have a ton of expeditions that are specifically sent to Antarctica for scientific purposes before what's known as the heroic age because Antarctica was still very poorly known um, and there was there was the, the the interest in the interest in countries sending lots of people to Antarctica to explore it would come as a result of, in part of countries really, the, especially the European powers really wanting to show each other up near the end of the 19th century um, in the in the lead up to the world wars. And it's it's something that I, I the connection between the connection between um, Antarctic exploration and geopolitical conflicts elsewhere is something that I, oh, Maki, why do you always want to sit there? <laughs> I love her too. She is just has a habit of sitting on the keyboard in bad places. I don't have a very big desk. Um, anyhow, um, you do want to consider how events elsewhere in the world correspond to um, how things went in Antarctica, because to a big extent, the heroic age later comes to an end right around the start of World War I, um, when the war breaking out um, and occupying most of the world's major powers um, really reduces the amount of the amount of resources that they want to spend on sending people to Antarctica. And um, but the heroic age is distinct because it's more it's when you have it's when you have many more it's when you have many more expeditions that are sent there for purely exploratory or scientific goals. Um, so themes to consider for the heroic age include why exploration sped up. And part of it was just more people being in the subantarctic islands. You had a lot of people going to the west coast of the US, United States because of the California gold rush, both from the Eastern US and from Europe. Um, and that really increased the presence of people in the Southern Ocean. And um, also countries began to look to Antarctic exploration as a way to as a way to use, as a way to, as a way to establish glory, as a way to be like, oh, look, we're the UK and we've sent people to the Antarctica and found this, this, and this. And then you'll have, no, we're France and we've went to Antarctica and discovered this, this, and this. And it's not quite as petty as that, but that, that factor does play a role into why exploration speeds up so much near the end of the 19th century when you have just about every major European country and then also Japan and Australia sending expeditions to Hawaii, uh, not Hawaii, to Antarctica. Captain Cook's third voyage was to Hawaii, not his not his second one. Um, I, I was like, why did Hawaii come into this? And my brain went to Captain Cook. Um, and again, I do really highly recommend that you watch the full videos of the lectures because I think I the narrative I give there helps put some of these people in context and put some of these themes in context. Um, so you want to think about the various goals of the expeditions I lingered on, like how, like the race to the South Pole or how Shackleton's famous expedition was originally an attempt to cross the whole continent and how the heroic age is named such for the increased focus on science as well as some of the hardships um, that many of the people experienced during what what were what were really the first the first serious expeditions on the continent because the heroic age sees the first people to overwinter south of the Antarctic Circle the first people to overwinter on Antarctica at all on the Antarctic continent and when I say that I mean that they actually stayed and remained on the continent for the entire winter the way that you have a small handful of scientists doing now those scientists who do it now have a much more comfortable base than the explorers who we're living in little wooden huts that, um, in one case, almost burnt down. Um, in the case of the Borskravink expedition, um, but you have the first people to reach the South Geographic Pole, um, the first people to reach the South Magnetic Pole, um, and you also just have a lot more of Antarctica being mapped. You have um, you have the Trans Antarctic Mountains being observed. You have you have life being discovered on the continent. You have penguins being observed, you have penguin colonies being discovered, you have people going onto the polar plateau, going onto the ice sheets for the first time. And a lot of this happens within a pretty concentrated window of time, the very end of the 19th century um, and the start of the 20th century. And in terms of heroic age figures that I'll, I would, I'm likely to ask you about, again, I'm much more likely to ask you about the people who showed up in multiple expeditions um, than someone who I just mentioned offhand once. And in the hints for the questions, there's a good chance that I will do my best to, um, in many cases, indicate both 
um, both any relevant names as well as the expedition itself. So let's consider the example question here, and that's which heroic age explorer accompanied Shackleton on his Nimrod expedition, climbing Mount Erebus with him, um, and I realize the answer is in here also, but, um, and later commandeered the Australian Antarctic expedition to the South Magnetic Pole, during which he almost died falling into, into a crevasse. Um, so who is this figure? And he is someone that shows up a couple of times, and this is one, this is on the slightly more obscure side of the questions you might see, because I don't talk about the answer to this question as much as some of the some of the other figures, but yes, it is Douglas Mawson, and the answer is on this slide. I realized, but that's but that's an example. That's 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 an example of one of the relatively few questions I might ask you about specific figures. And in the context of the question, I do give you a sense of what expedition this was, why he's important, and also what specific hardships he faced. Um, um, in addition to almost falling into, in addition to almost dying when he fell into a crevasse, um, he also ended up having to spend a whole another winter in Antarctica because he got back to the site where the rescue ship was supposed to pick him up um, a few days after it. A few days after it left, um, he just got lucky that they had left some other people behind with supplies um, to last the winter. But the I, I don't want you to be intimidated by the history stuff and by the sheer amount, the sheer amount of it, it does, it, it can come across as rather dense, but I, I'm, I will do my best to make the questions give you context that should hopefully help that stick out more. So any questions about the heroic age before I move on from that? All right, Maki says no more questions. I just heard her meow. And so then the first half of lecture 14 summed up the post-heroic age history of Antarctica, the territorial claims um, made in the wake of the heroic age and the simmering tensions over who owns Antarctica. And then a sampling of some of the, some of these, the expeditions that occurred um, before the international geophysical year. Like you have people making the first attempts to build permanent bases like Richard Byrd's Little America, um, during which he also became the first person to fly to the South Pole. Um, and that established an important precedent of air travel to the eventual South Pole base being mostly air-based um, until they built a road, not till the 2000s. Um, but then you have the, then you had examples like the UK establishing a military presence um, in Antarctica and the sub-Antarctic islands to out of a fear that Argentina would collaborate with the Axis powers during World War II, and then the US making a, making basically training for us, make basically looking for a site to put a training camp, but using that, but using a cover story about um, taking photographs as, as the cover story. Um, and how in general, there was a, there was a consensus that countries, unless something was put into law would, potentially misuse Antarctica, potentially potentially um, use it for military purposes. And there was no real legal basis as to who really owned Antarctica and whose territory it was and what ability people had to build military bases. Um, and then questions of, OK, the heroic age explorers found did find some evidence that there was coal or um, iron. and eventually people are going to want to start looking at Antarctica for these resources. Um, so we should probably codify something that regulates whether people can do that and whether, whether that's, whether that's an acceptable use of Antarctica. Um, so the international geophysical year was a big turning point. It was after World War II during a bit of a thaw in the cold war between the U S and its allied, um, allied um, countries and the communist bloc, basically the Soviet Union and its allies. And you had a number of these countries that were more or less con considered themselves enemies during the Cold Wars, actually during the Cold War, um, they actually collaborated on research together. Um, and a lot of the projects were based on findings like related to Mount Erebus or penguins that had been noted during the heroic age, but not really returned to since because not many people visited Antarctica during the period between the heroic age and the international geophysical year. So you had a lot of projects on on geology and physics and a lot of that is in Antarctica and it and not just those two not just those two subfields but it's the main focus. Um, and it 
it directly does lead to the Antarctic Treaty System. It, it, it leads to the drafting up of a legally binding treaty that outlines how Antarctica is to be used, how Antarctica isn't doesn't really belong to any nation, and how these territorial claims can't be enforced, how um, countries can't use Antarctica for military purposes, um, but countries can build bases to do science, and those science, the science conducted there must be made available to other countries, because the idea is that doing low impact science is great. In fact, that's really what we want people to use Antarctica for. Um, but it can't be just one country doing science and then claiming the results for itself. It needs to be science that is hypothetically beneficial to all of humanity. Um, so the question here is, I. So the question here is an example of one I might give, and I, I gave the I and I, I gave the answer away. The answer here would be mining because I've mentioned some tourism still still goes on, some fishing still goes on, um, flying helicopters. I've mentioned flying in helicopters in Antarctica. There's nothing against that, um, and international base examinations refers to how um, the part in the treaty that I lingered on where that says that any country's actions are open to scrutiny or examination by other countries, which has led to um, teams made of people representing different countries doing examinations of bases to check on their check on whether they're up to code or what's what's being conducted there. Um, and that's something actually that is um, encouraged by the treaty, not banned by it. So that wouldn't be the answer there. Um, the second half of this lecture went more, so the second half of this lecture was about the consequences of the Antarctic Treaty, how um, the treaty the treaty more or less sets aside Antarctica for conservation, um, and how it specifically sets aside some areas as Antarctic Special Protection Areas, or basically Antarctic National Parks, where there is a lot more paperwork required to enter them or do research in them, and where they're set aside because of delicate natural resources like, like wind erosion structures, vent effects, or microbiotic communities that could be fragile, or ice features that could easily be damaged. Um, and then we talked about current economic activity in Antarctica, as well as what might be possible if the treaty were to expire or if it had not been enforced. How you have tourism, how you have fishing going on, um, including some whaling. Um, by countries that continue to claim um, a research exemption to that, and how there is potential for minerals and fossil fuels to be extracted from the continent, but how that is completely banned by the treaty, and in part to in part to stem to stem open warfare on the continent because because again countries often countries go to war for many reasons, but often it has to do with with, with natural resources like oil. And um, on that note, the example question here is one I might ask you about one of the geopolitical conflicts we lingered on. And in this question, I try to give you some context that makes it clear that I'm talking about recent history and not something from the from the from the 19th from the from the 18th or 19th century. Um, so although the Falkland War of the 1980s was related to longstanding territorial tensions between Argentina and the UK, it broke out in part due to the fact that both countries wanted what natural resource found in the area. And I see some answers popping up. Um, the answer is indeed E, oil. Um, because indeed, you do have whales and fur seals around the Falkland Islands, and there were sealing colonies set up there. But that was really much earlier that whaling and sealing were a huge part of the Antarctic economy, so to speak. And um, copper mining doesn't really happen in Antarctica. Um, and also, I. And Antarctic toothfish are being overfished, but they weren't the cause of the Falklands War. And really, Argentina and the UK went to war because there is there is oil in the ocean off the Falkland Islands. Um, and so I'm not likely to ask a ton of questions like that, but if I have a slide on if I have a slide on an event like I have a slide on the Falklands War as well as on the Vela incident like the one instance in which you had atomic bombs tested near Antarctica, um, then it's good to know why I lingered on it like why this why this is important for studying Antarctica under the treaty system. Um, so any questions about human history of Antarctica before I go on to climate change. <laughs> 
OK, then, cool. I might have to break this lecture up when I upload it because it's getting a bit long, but that's fine. Um, so we then covered climate change. And in the first half of lecture 15, I talked about controls on climate, like Milankovitch cycles, um, the cycles in Earth's orbit related to the tilt of the axis, the precession of the axis, and the eccentricity of the orbit, and how that plays into changing Earth's climate on long-term scales, as do, as do plate tectonics, and as does overall, in general, the abundance of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere. I delved more into then the role of greenhouse gases and how different physical or biological or geological processes will add or remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and about feedbacks, how the current climate crisis is being made worse by positive feedbacks, such as the increased absorption of solar radiation as melting sea ice is replaced by dark ocean water that has lower albedo. Lecture 16 then focused on paleoclimatology and Antarctica's climate record in the first half, and then the specific effects of climate change on Antarctica during the second half. And we learned about several different types of greenhouse gases, how water, the most abundant one, isn't being affected on a global scale by human actions, but how burning fossil fuels is releasing excess CO2 and methane and also nitrous oxide a bit. I didn't, I didn't really linger on NO much, but um, I lingered. I talked about how methane is especially bad um, because it absorbs infrared light to such a strong to such a degree like it 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 absorbs a lot of infrared light for every molecule compared to co2 and methane being released into the atmosphere um will create a much larger radiative forcing and remember the radiative forcing refers to how much refers to the difference in energy being absorbed being reaching Earth via solar radiation and that being re-emitted by Earth as infrared radiation. Because greenhouse gases stop a lot of that infrared radiation from being emitted back to space. And again, it's worth reviewing the climate slides from earlier in the unit, from earlier um, in the class, um, if some of this seems fuzzy to you. Um, I realize they're kind of at opposite ends of the class and that's not ideal, but it's it's hard to get everything completely perfect. Um, so the practice question here is to remind you of what a greenhouse gas is and which ones are being affected the most in terms of their concentrations in the atmosphere by human actions, because this unit is about human caused climate change. Um, again, I do delve into, I do delve into um, natural processes that influence climate, but to give you a broader idea of how climate does change over time and to rule them out as potential causes for the warming that we're presently seeing. So which of the following is a greenhouse gas that is not being released by humans in large amounts? Um, and so some of these are greenhouse gases and some of them are not. That's actually one way that you can do process of elimination. Um, so in this possible question, and I, I have the answer elsewhere on the slide, it's water vapor that is that is a greenhouse gas that's but that's not really being added by humans. Um, the three the, the two things on here that are not greenhouse gases and thus are not possible answers are CFCs or chlorinated fluorocarbons. And those destroy the ozone, which is not good, but they don't cause climate change. They're not greenhouse gases. I talked about them completely separately. And then carbonate um, is not a gas at all. Carbonate is the solid um, carbon compound in snail and coral shells that actually um, when it forms it it, it helps actually take CO2 away because the CO2 is ultimately turned into carbonate. Um, carbon dioxide and methane are being added by people. Water vapor is not. Water vapor, I devoted a slide to in part to linger on the fact that yes, water vapor um, absorbs infrared radiation, but the overall amount in the atmosphere is not being changed by burning fossil fuels. So. I spent a while on the carbon cycle and how processes either remove CO2 from the atmosphere by converting it ultimately to hydrocarbons or to carbonate, um, or how they add CO2 to the atmosphere. And you want to you want to be familiar with terms like sources and sinks. Sources being processes um, that add CO2 or whatever compound you're interested to whatever reservoir you're interested in, and don't get hung up on this, but when I talk about cycles, you want to remember that if you talk about processes as being sources or sinks, you have to define what they are sources to and what they are sinks from. 
we're usually interested in the atmosphere because it is CO2 in the atmosphere, increased CO2 in the atmosphere that is causing global temperatures to go up. And so we're interested in sources that add CO2 to the atmosphere and sinks that take it out. You have cell respiration from organisms eating other organisms that makes CO2. That is why we breathe carbon dioxide out. And then you have organic matter either decomposing, which is actually, again, fungi and microorganisms eating um, and doing cell respiration, or if you burn organic matter, and that includes burning of fossil fuels. And then you have volcanic eruptions. Um, things that take CO2 out of the atmosphere are organic carbon burial, actually fossil fuel formation. When you form coal and oil, that actually keeps the organic matter from decomposing and stores it underground as hydrocarbons for, for thousands or millions of years. Um, and the reason that fossil fuels are contributing to the climate crisis today is because we are digging them up and burning them. Um, you also have carbonate formation um, and the carbonate in um, shells in the ocean eventually when those organisms die ends up on the ocean floor and ends up being subducted where ocean crust disappears into um, disappears into the mantle to be recycled. Um, you have long-lived plants like forests, like, like cacti and trees in forests, um, converting CO2 into hydrocarbons. And then you have weathering. You have, um, you have rainwater absorbing CO2 in the air and bringing CO2 down to rocks made of silicate where um, it then undergoes a chemical reaction. And that ultimately takes the CO2 out of the atmosphere because it gets converted into carbonate that ends up flowing to the ocean in water that's running to the ocean. And that's actually to a big, that's actually to some extent where the carbonate in the ocean comes from. Um, so one of the questions, the, the potential question here is related to one of these things or sources. Volcanic activity, which releases both carbon dioxide and aerosols into the air, contributes only to global warming and not to global cooling. So is this true or is it false? It is indeed false. It's false because um, I mentioned the aerosols to indicate volcanoes do put something else out. They actually, um, they actually release little little solid particles in the air that actually block sunlight out and reduce the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth. And that's that's why the hint is in there. Um, a lot of true or false questions that I put on the test will have a hint like this. I don't know if you can hear the seagulls going going mad, but my cat is very interested in them. Um, and the thing to remember is that that's like what happened after the dinosaur extinction. Particulate matter in the air causes the sun to be blocked out. So we then talked about feedbacks um, when a system is in equilibrium, how in response to a shift from that equilibrium, a system might either correct itself to bring the system back to equilibrium, which would be a negative feedback, or the result might instead initiate more processes that take the system further and further away from equilibrium. And that is a positive feedback, even though the effect, again, is not necessarily good. The term positive doesn't have anything to do with um, um, the, what was I going to say? The doesn't have anything to do with the effects being good or bad. Um, it posit positive refers to more and more and more, like more and more and more away from the system. And so the current climate crisis is marked by a number of positive feedback processes that are simply put making it worse. And the example question is one where I might test your knowledge on a specific feedback process related to the climate um, crisis that I talked about. So the melting of blank, the frozen layer in the Arctic soil from climate change is releasing methane, an example of a blank feedback. So what would be the answer here? Yes, the answer is indeed D because it's permafrost I'm talking about. That's, that's what this frozen soil is. It's not a glacier I'm talking about. And it's a positive feedback because remember, methane is a greenhouse gas and the permafrost is melting from climate change. When the permafrost melts, it releases more methane and that makes climate change worse. So it takes it even further away from equilibrium. So it's a positive feedback. So that's 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 an example of a question that I might that I might give you about feedbacks. We're almost done with the review, but does anybody have questions about the lecture? This would have been lecture 15. 
that talked overall about the science of climate change, feedbacks, the carbon cycle, and the like. So positive and negative feedback. Positive is just means like more. Yes. A positive, if something is experiencing positive feedback, it's taking the system farther and farther away from equilibrium, just like how more and more greenhouse gases is making the earth hotter and hotter and putting it way out of equilibrium. Oh, OK, thank you. Yep. So um, we then talked about how we know about, about all of this, how we have a sense that Earth's present temperature and atmospheric um, greenhouse gas concentrations aren't normal and they aren't really easily explainable by natural processes. So I talked about how you can use proxies um, like ocean sediments or the patterns in glacial varves, the sediments, um, the sediments that are um, dropped by glacial meltwater, um, as well as cave formations because those contain carbonate um, and the carbonate um, contains oxygen where you can study isotopes, where you can study, where you can study, where you can study oxygen isotopes, um, and how tree rings can be used, how tree rings can be used for this, and how plant fossil distributions can tell you what kinds of climates you had in different areas, and then also how we can sample directly using ice cores. And, um, and ice cores are taken from high points on an ice sheet where ice is accumulating fastest and the age can be determined by determining the accumulation rate since the air um, and since the air only gets trapped once the glacier is compacted which happens around 50 meters of depth a correction has to be made to calculate the age of the trapped air which is going to be younger than the ice itself so with that correction we have a time capsule of global air concentrations from past times to go with the records of oxygen isotopes we have from um, seafloor sediment carbonate or from the carbonate in, um, in cave formations. Um, and remember that we study oxygen isotopes because processes like glacier formation um, change the isotope ratios in the ocean. The oxygen has two stable isotopes. It has O18 and O16. And um, when there's a lot of glaciation, O16, which normally gets taken out of the ocean um, by evaporation, but then gets returned to the ocean by um, that water returning to the ocean as snow and, and rain. Um, since you have so much of the world's water getting locked up in glaciers, the O16 gets locked up there in, in there as well. And the ocean, the, the isotope ratio of the ocean changes. The You get more O18 in the ocean and you notice that in the carbonates formed by that were formed by ocean creatures that were alive at the time. Um, and so hopefully one takeaway you had from this part of the lecture was that um, we use different methods to correlate. We look at, um, we look at the absolute um, CO2 concentrations from ice cores, and then we'll look at oxygen, how oxygen isotopes change in the carbonates that we find on the sea floor and to see how those correlate. And we can, and that's one reason that we've been able to determine that CO2 concentrations do correlate to a big extent with, with, how, with how warm the earth was, which is something that we can determine from proxies like seafloor carbonates or cave formations or tree rings. Um, and the cool thing is that the ice cores really do give us a time capsule of past air because Antarctica is quite far removed from either sources or sinks of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So it represents a good average of global air. It's far from most biological activity. The Where the ice sheets are building up in the interior of the continent is basically lifeless. Um, it's far from factories and other industries and it's far from even volcanoes that, you have a couple of volcanoes in Antarctica, yeah, but not a lot. Um, it's far from, it's far from large volcanic chains that are gonna be putting out a lot of CO2. Um, and so that's the really cool thing about the Antarctic um, ice cores. And during the second half of lecture 16, I talked about the specific effects of climate change on Antarctica. And Antarctica has been less directly affected by climate change than many parts of the world, but you've seen air temperatures go up rapidly and the ocean has gotten warmer. The warmer ocean has brought more energy, which has provided fuel for stronger winds and a warmer ocean inhibits Antarctic bottom water formation and also causes sea ice to start breaking up. And the sea ice not forming as consistently or thickly also slows Antarctic bottom water formation because Antarctic bottom water forms 
when you get really cold and salty water. And less sea ice means that less of that can form. Um, sea ice melting has also, um, sea ice melting hasn't caused sea level rises. Um, sea level rises have largely been caused by melting of the ice sheets where the water has not been in the ocean for, for millennia. So the Greenland ice sheet is contributing to sea level rise as is the Western Arctic ice sheet, which is near the peninsula. And again, a lot of the most drastic effects are most noticeable in the peninsula because it's the farthest north part of Antarctica. Um, it's where the ocean has warmed the most and where the air has warmed the most. And it's overall actually one of the fastest warming parts of the continent. Um, and a lot of the ecological consequences have been most heavily seen there. A lot of the sea ice loss has occurred around the peninsula and the sea ice loss has meant the loss of habitat for the krill and the phytoplankton that rely on that sea ice during the winter, as well as penguins like Adelie penguins that breed and feed on the sea ice. Um, and then you've also had some species expand their range, like you've had plants in Antarctica, the two native flowering plant species that live mostly on the peninsula have started showing up, growing on outcrops where they were never visible before because it was too cold. But now that the temperatures are warmer, you're seeing them expand their range. And you might also see more invasive species in Antarctica as Antarctica becomes more hospitable to outside life. Um, and the sample question should hopefully be easy enough to figure out if you consider, so the following, the potential question is which of the following organisms it's seeing its range increase as a result of melting sea ice and increased open water. Um, so the way, so some process of elimination you can do here, midges are land animals. That's, I linger on them as like the one, as like the largest insect species you have. Um, toothfish I talked about being declining from overfishing as opposed to sea, sea ice. And also I didn't really ever talk about Antarctic toothfish as being dependent on sea ice, especially, um, nor with emperor penguins really. Emperor penguins aren't really gonna benefit from melting sea ice because it's, um, because they actually breed on the continent itself. The answer is indeed salp. Salp and krill are the two open water organisms I talked about in the context of sea ice and krill depend on the ice. And so, um, krill are, their range is going down and their population is going down as well. But salp are creatures that live in the open water and so they're seeing their range expand. So even if you don't specifically remember what salp were, you can actually do a decent process of elimination. You can realize that krill depend on the ice, midges are land animals, Antarctic toothfish I don't really talk about in the context of ice ever, and emperor penguins are not benefiting from, from loss of sea ice at all. So that's it for our review session, basically. Um, good luck with studying. And remember that I won't be hosting formal review sessions um, during finals week, but I will be around for regular office hours and I will also be available by email. And I really liked teaching this class. Antarctica is a big personal interest of mine. And I hope that I've been able to make it interesting for people, even if you didn't come into the class knowing or expecting um, much about the continent. So take care. Um, and I will leave the recording on for a moment if people have questions that they're comfortable having recorded. Yep, thank you all for coming to this. And I think I'll go ahead and just shut the recording off in the meantime. So enjoy.